Hello everyone and welcome to the webinar Using and Developing Software in Social Science and Humanities Research. Let me start by introducing myself and your speaker today. I'm Amy Sparrow, I'm the Product Marketing Manager for Sage Ocean and your moderator. Your speaker today is the wonderful Danielle, Dr. Daniela Duca. She's the Product Manager for Sage Ocean. Daniela works on scoping out new products for Sage Ocean, exploring software for social sciences and collabor collaborating with startups to bring their tools to market. For those who don't know, Sage Ocean is an initiative by Sage Publishing dedicated to equipping social scientists with the tools, resources and skills they need to work with big data and new computational methods. We do this in a variety of ways uh, through our tools directory. Um, and please, I invite you to check this out afterwards. So it searches and categorizes all the tools that are available for research um, through our concept grants. So our concept grants are a grant of over 2,000 for new research software ideas or 15,000 to scale up new early software tools. And our 2020 applications are now open. We also have a product, Sage Campus, which is online data science courses specifically for social scientists. And listeners today get a 25% discount with the code TOOLS25. And we also run a pretty po popular blog and a regular big data newsletter, which you can subscribe for today at ocean.sagepub.com. But don't worry, all these links will be emailed out to you afterwards, so you don't have to remember them now. So how the um, webinar will run today is that you're going to hear a presentation from Daniela, and at the end, Daniela will answer your questions that you send in. And how you send in your questions is through the question box on your screen. Um, if someone could try and post a question just to confirm that they, that is working, and then also through the Twitter hashtag Sage Talks. Um, but before we start, we want to hear a bit more about you and who you are in this room. So I want you to answer a quick poll for me on what you do. So one second. Okay. Can everyone see the poll of what you do? Yeah, I can see the answers coming in. I'll give you a couple of minutes and we can see the split of the room. Oh, coming in. We'll do a little bit longer. We've got 53% of you have voted so far. Great. 71%. Great. And we're done. So I can share the responses. And I think you should all be able to see that now. So it looks like we've got mostly academics in the room, 67%. 16% uh, are librarians or in research support or research technologists. 12% student and 4% in industry or entrepreneurs. Brilliant. Okay, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over Dan to Daniela. Give me one second, Daniela. Sorry, right, we're just some meeting, uh, Daniela, hold on. Okay, great. Um, hello, everyone. Thanks, uh, so many of you. Really glad to see so many of you here. I'm just going to try and hide my webcam, otherwise I won't see any of my slides. Um, right, so the way we're, we're going to go today is first, I'll be super excited to share with you our findings from looking at about uh, a little bit over 400 different tools and software uh, used by social science researchers, potentially you, <laughs> and get your feedback and questions. And really glad to see there are a lot of academics because I'm very interested in what you think and what, kind, what other type of information you would um, find more useful. Um, loads of people have asked us why we We've done this so we'll start by by sharing that so why we looked at these 400 tools um, I'll briefly go over a summary of the findings so and maybe um, if we have time I'll uh, speculate a bit about the future of tools and we'll share some of our next steps and some of our the next things that we are doing in this space 
In, back in 2016, uh, we ran a large survey and we got uh, responses from about 10,000 uh, social science researchers. We were interested in interested to see how they're working, how social science researchers are starting to work or working with uh, big data and new technologies. And we were looking, we, we've also asked about their challenges. So uh, we found that a lot of them are um, finding it difficult, obviously funding for research. That's, uh, that's something that's been always there, uh, but also getting access to data, finding collaborators to, with the right skills and knowledge to work together, um, learning new software and methods um, for, for themselves to work with this type of data. So we, we wanted to focus on this, on these uh, challenges and see what we can do uh, within our team to uh, support social science researchers that are starting to work with uh, computational methods and larger scale data. And my particular interest was in uh, software. And uh, last summer, we ran through our big data newsletter um, a, a much smaller survey <laughs> where we got about 149 responses uh, to try and understand, well, is really uh, research software important for social science researchers? And it is indeed more than uh, two thirds of the respondents said it was either critical or very important. And uh, the large majority are using research software for uh, their um, process, so for their processes, and about 10% are actually developing their own software. Now, you might think that this is a very small number, but the equivalent figure uh, for um, STEM uh, subjects is about 30%. And this is from um, the, the first data that's coming out of um, Southampton University um, that's run by uh, software, the Software Sustainable, Sustainability Institute. So with all this in mind and with, uh, with the ideas that we had within our team and our mission to enable social science researchers to work with big data and technology, we've been looking and finding and promoting new technologies um, that are useful for these um, um, uh, new methods, uh, but also some, some of the older <laughs> methods uh, for qualitative research as well. Um, and as uh, Amy mentioned, we've done this through the concept grants, so we've funded so far four different different uh, software tools, uh, DDNA that works with um, uh, Twitter data, Quantida for text mining, Minivan um, for um, uh, graph, uh, so network graph visualizations, and TextWash, which is um, the, the latest one that's working to anonymize text data. We've also done an investment in TagWorks, which is an annotation tool, and I'll mention more about this uh, later in, um, in this webinar. So how we, we've done this in a variety of ways and uh, by constantly reviewing alternatives to existing tools, uh, looking through conference websites and archives, looking at prominent labs like the Public Data Lab, the, um, the Digital Methods Initiative, the Social Media Lab in Canada. We've been looking at other directories and lists, not necessarily coming from the social sciences, but LabWorm, which is sort of a biomedical um, list of tools, but has loads of uh, data visualization tools. The DIRT directory, which comes more from the digital humanists. Uh, we've been looking at academic papers that are referencing or describing the this, these tools. We've also looked at the at the um, uh, the research and the survey um, and a lot of the work that has been done by Kramer and, and uh, Bossman around the innovations in the scholarly communication cycle. And we've, in, we've been enriching the data about the tools that we've been collecting with uh, information from Wikipedia and Crunchbase. Now, I'll take a little pit stop here just to explain what I mean by tools um, and the fact that with, with the tools that we've been looking at, we're actually referring to uh, anything. So anything from uh, uh, either cloud applications or locally installed applications, uh, any type of packages uh, or pieces of code, libraries for R, for Python. Um, so anything that's coming from um, either uh, big tech or, or smaller companies um, and um, anything that we could find on GitHub or uh, as I said, other uh, list of of, um, 
uh, resources and, and software, but we try to look for tools that we know either from researchers themselves or we saw them in academic papers in the social sciences. So we have some sort of limit um, around that. And um, this is a bit of a simplification of the research process, but I just wanted to mention that we've also focused specifically on the collection and the analysis of tools. So anything um, around, I don't know, scraping websites or running surveys and uh, running interviews or experiments um, and analyzing that type of uh, data. Uh, we, uh, Yes, so there may be some, some of them um, from outside this process that are creeping in, but those weren't our focus. So now we'll go over the summary findings. Um, and if you haven't uh, had a look at the white paper, I definitely recommend you to, because I'll be very brief here. Um, we've seen a growing number of tools, and at least in the sample that, that we have, um, the, the half of them are coming from the United States. Um, a good number, so a good number is uh, from the UK, but there are also other uh, countries that are producing tools that you wouldn't uh, necessarily <laughs> think about. Um, and we are hoping to find even more um, from around the world um, and specifically when looking at uh, social science research done in other languages. What we, what I also found quite interesting and I thought it was going to be interesting for academics particularly is looking at the, uh, the growth of tools that are um, free or paid and so I think I, I know that that makes a big difference so um, from our conversation with uh, academics they're saying well first I'm gonna look if a tool is free or available to my institution. Um, and uh, we were surprised to see that both uh, the number of um, tools that are free as well as uh, those that uh, charge a fee for academics have been growing um, in the past uh, years. Um, although they are, um, the split is quite even, I would say, and you know, considering our sample might be slightly biased. The other thing that we've been looking at is who's behind the tools. So the type of organizations that are running or maintaining those tools. Um, and not surprising, a lot of them are private um, and um, they do offer the paid, the paid solutions uh, for anyone but um, academics, um, as well as academics. Um, and there are quite a number of um, uh, tools coming from the public sector. Um, and uh, obviously the the tools that are coming from the public sector are um, university tools or coming from other charitable organizations. So not surprising as well, um, there are quite a lot of individuals that are uh, producing their own tools. So we saw 10% of our respondents uh, are saying that they are um, creating their own software to, to do their research. And so that's as you, as you can see from, from this sample, um, there are 53 um, different tools that are produced by individuals and are maintained uh, by these individuals. Um, a, a new trend or a, an interesting trend in the space is also institutions that are coming together uh, to support um, a number of tools uh, or support infrastructure for research. And so about nine of the tools that are used by social science researchers are actually supported by these consortia. And these are different. So in Europe, for example, there is the, the SESTA and the DARIA infrastructure. Um, there is the, the So Big Data project. In the US, uh, the Center for Open Science. In Australia, there's NECTAR. But there are also some disciplinary um, organizations or uh, organizations that are not necessarily providing funding, but are providing different type of support, like the Software Sustainability Institute around governance and what to do uh, when developing open source software software, um, the Pelagios Commons and uh, NumFocus are uh, providing uh, guidance around um, a di a di different type of aspects of uh, the development of software and the Social Media Research Foundation and other similar foundations that are growing in this space. We've also been looking a little bit into the people that are behind these tools and we were interested 
to see what's the diversity like. Um, and obviously we couldn't find uh, a lot of information about this, especially some of the tools that are coming from uh, large tech companies is uh, not always easy to find who's behind them. Uh, but out of the 271 tools that we were able to identify the people that either funded those tools or uh, sorry, founded those tools or were involved in the development, um, which were 410 people, only 38 were women. Um, and <laughs> quite disappointing, but we are hoping that that balance will change, or at least as we get more information about the tools, uh, we'll, we'll find that balance changing. So we wanted to, uh, produce, to uh, promote uh, diversity and promote um, these tools that were developed by women. And we started with a little blog where we um, um, highlighted some of the tools um, that we thought were interesting. And uh, some of them are quite um, uh, known in, in the field uh, that have been uh, founded or, or had uh, women in their development team. One interesting uh, thing that probably everybody um, is um, is asking <laughs> um, is, well, what are the successful tools? And I wanted to, obviously, I'm, I didn't do a very thorough research here, so I can't say that um, I found any patterns that are robust, uh, but from the few that I've been able to identify, so from the few tools that I've been able to identify as successful, meaning uh, tools that have um, either been acquired or potentially have grown uh, um, um, beyond, I don't know, 10 years uh, of lifetime and are still around and are still used uh, or um, have uh, gone to do an IPO um, and, and um, or have like really good numbers in their sales figures. Um, what I've been able to identify were a few things. So in this case, I'm looking um, differently. So the open source and free tools, so the, the tools that, that don't charge a fee, so don't um, uh, don't think of maintaining themselves on the long term uh, from um, uh, revenues, uh, from customer revenues, what they're doing is they almost always have a team or an individual that is entirely dedicated to raising funds to maintain um, the tool. And in, in many cases, um, the, the funds may be small, but in uh, quite a, a small number of cases that, that funding is quite large. So one of the tools has uh, been able to raise up to 6 million over a period of about three or four years. Um, and when these tools are applicable beyond academia, they're almost always backed by a very large and always constantly growing community of users and um, of, of contributors. Oh, so what I'm, I forgot to mention is that actually the uh, the funds are being raised from well-known organizations like the Omidyar Network or the Sloan or the Mellon Foundation. And when I looked at the commercial tools that have been successful and are used by social science researchers, what I found is that their applicability is almost always beyond academia. So sometimes they do start uh, with the academic in mind, but all, uh, but almost always they sort of expand um, and do serve uh, businesses and other industries. The funding that they raise is out of this world, <laughs> in some cases up to 400 million. Um, necessarily they have big brand clients almost immediately as to, or as soon as they start or as soon as they launch. And uh, their founding team either has um, a person at least with some business background or a serial entrepreneur. Um, so also the, the VC backing that they get is from um, quite uh, well-known uh, funders like the Y Combinator, Axel Index Ventures and Sequoia. Now, going back to our sample. So the list of tools that we have, as I mentioned, it is biased because we We've been collecting these uh, tools from a variety of sources, uh, maybe or, uh, initially not um, in a very systematic way. So um, just from recently, we started doing it a bit more thorough. So we've looked at social media tools. That's why you see a big bubble here. Uh, we've looked a lot at annotation tools, so text annotation, because that's a big um, area in social sciences. Um, and now we're looking at text mining. So you'll see that bubble grow even further. 
So in terms of social media, uh, we've uh, we've um, we've put up some blogs um, as we've analyzed the landscape, uh, and there are a lot of people actually that are looking at uh, social media tools. So uh, loads of resources out there. Most of the tools uh, for social media are in the collection um, space, and some in well, some in the analysis, but almost all of them provide some uh, way of collecting tweets, um, especially. Um, and I say especially because um, most likely <laughs> Twitter it has become quite popular because of their more lenient um, API, which is not the case anymore, but um, um, that kind of boosted the number of tools that uh, were being developed. And this is, you know, there are about 100 tools in here and there are even more um, uh, that are available um, on, on, online because social media is used not just by academic researchers, but um, it's sort of, it's on the mind of every single company that's out there. Uh, what we found um, as, as challenges, I guess, was um, the fact that it was to some, or at least to some researchers, it was somewhat hard to automate the, the text analysis, especially because tweets uh, or other comments are quite short. Um, it's hard to pick up on some uh, signals that they were interested in analyzing. And um, quite surprising, and something that I would be um, interested and curious to find out more about, is the fact that there's um, not a lot on image analysis. So although a lot of image and video and media is shared, uh, probably probably more than text on social media. There's still not a lot of uh, research around that. Now, I want to stop a little bit and uh, talk about the survey tools, even though this may not necessarily, um, I don't know, qualify as a computational social science space, but is probably the type of tool that um, a social science researchers have used at least once in their research career. Um, and also because this space is quite interesting because it has all kinds of examples. So you have um, REDCap, which is a tool that has been developed for biomedical um, and clinical research and has been funded by National Institute of Health, is open source, is free, is super popular and used by um, academics in the social sciences. Um, you have uh, a variety of surveys, uh, survey tools, and this one in particular was uh, funded by an angel investor is still around. Um, other tools like Typeform and Qualtrics have raised a lot of money um, and obviously they serve more than the academic sector. But as, as many of you might know, Qualtrics did start um, with uh, the academics in mind. And there are also uh, tools um, in the space like the online surveys and smart survey academic that were specifically developed with the, um, ac the academic researcher in mind and they in a way they they limited themselves to that um, to that market um, and there are you know everybody has used survey monkey <laughs> I presume and um, it is a very a very very uh, popular tool maybe not liked by everybody, but it does make a lot of money. And um, it's managed to do that because they actually hired uh, um, a person with uh, consulting experience as a CEO. And so, and when they went public last, uh, last year. Also last year uh, was a, a very interesting uh, year for uh, survey tools because Qualtrics was acquired by SAP for about 8 billion. Right, so, but for you as academics, surveys, uh, using a survey tool is not necessarily enough. You know, you, you need some way of um, uh, recruiting your participants, of managing the participants. Maybe you want to go beyond surveys and, and design some, uh, some experiments. So in this space, there are, obviously, there are the simple forms and, and survey tools. There are the simple experiment tools, but there are also uh, tools that help you um, recruit and manage participants while you're also administering, administering uh, surveys. And um, I'll say that Qualtrics, which I just mentioned, they raised a lot of money, but for not for no reason. They actually integrated a lot with uh, recruiting participants and tried to respond to uh, a lot of the challenges in the space. Uh, one of the newer entrants, which is probably one of my favorite companies, I'll say, mm -hmm. uh, because it's uh, it's uh, it's an exceptional company. They made their uh, minimum viable product in four weeks. They went ahead um, with uh, launching it. Uh, now um, it's quite popular and they're really, their mission is around uh, recruiting uh, participants for whatever experiment or survey you're running, but um, 
uh, with sort of ethical uh, values in mind and you know not paying um, below uh, the average cost of living. Um, also in, in this space, uh, an interesting company that's also coming from uh, academia is Volunteer Science and that's from uh, David Lazar's lab and um, it's helping you run online experiments and recruiting participants that um, do so that do that experiment at the same time, uh, which is fascinating. Once you have some data, either you've scraped it uh, online you've, or you have some, um, some free text survey results, you want to do some analysis and, um, and text annotation is quite popular in the social sciences and you'll be probably very familiar with um, the, the right-hand quadrant at the bottom, which are uh, what are called the, the um, CAC test tools. Um, and but if you so and, and as well if you want to do some very simple annotations there are tools like annotate and uh, anaphora which don't offer as many uh, features as um, tools like Invivo or deduce but uh, can do some basic annotation now in in the pre in the previous probably five or ten years there's been a boom in, in sort of quite simple annotation tools uh, for text and that were driven uh, by um, uh, so the, the development of natural language processing and the development of, of different algorithms and sort of all these data science teams that suddenly needed a lot of annotated text uh, to be, feed into their algorithms. Um, and they're also, if you if you want to go further, and that's normally what social sciences um, are doing, you want to go further and do maybe nested annotations or hierarchical annotations. And in, in that case, you need something a bit more complex. Uh, so we funded a tool in the space, it's called Tagworks, um, that are doing that are crowdsourcing your uh, annotators, but also um, helping you break down your, your schema in a more um, sort of digestible way for, for the workers. Now, very uh, so the natural next step is uh, once you did some uh, or a minimum, uh, a little bit of qualitative analysis of text, you do want to work, you may want to work with larger corpora. So um, you may be looking into automating uh, your text analysis. So also known as, as text mining. So for, for that, um, a lot of people do need um, to start learning things like Python or R to work with uh, different libraries that can help you do um, extract more value from, from sort of the large corpus you've got. Uh, but there are some tools that um, that can help you do that without knowing any uh, any skills like uh, Orange and Quantida Studio, which is something that we've uh, we've funded as well. Um, and we've we've started looking um, in this space, and um, it's uh, absolutely fascinating all the different algorithms that are being developed by the big tech right now, um, from from uh, Bert and Elmo and so on. Um, and so we've we've probably have a bit more of a bit over 70 tools in the space, but there is a, a webinar coming on uh, this subject in particular, so watch out for that. So what would be or what are the challenges that we've heard from researchers um, around, specifically around tools? Uh, most often we hear the question, well, how do I find the right tool and how do I know that it is good enough for the type of research that I want to do? There are still, even though there are quite a number of um, uh, principles for citing tools and um, that have been w developed uh, with the community, um, there are still challenges around uh, citation and especially uh, when publishing in uh, disciplinary journals uh, that don't require as much technical background um, in the paper. Also, um, the researchers, or at least the researchers that are developing the tools, uh, have told us about um, their challenge of getting credit for uh, for developing a tool. Um, and sort of, in 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 some ways, it's not really a big dilemma, but it's a big dilemma. Do you how if you, if there are, if people don't cite the tool, can they cite my paper? If they cite my paper, then my tool doesn't get cited, and so on. Um, the biggest challenge, probably in this space, is obviously sustainability. So so how do you make sure that your tool or the tool you've developed or the tool you're using uh, potentially as well is sustainable beyond um, the funding period? So um, even us, as we are funding uh, these 
um, uh, prototypes and these tools, we're always thinking and always discussing with the teams, well, how do you make sure that once this funding ends, um, that the tool sustains itself or has grown a community that's big enough uh, to make those contributions and maintain the tool longer term. And not surprisingly, um, because a lot of the computational social scientists are working with data that's digitally born and a lot of the data that we create and is digitally born and social science researchers are interested is still behind uh, big tech companies and that's becoming increasingly difficult to get to. So, so far we've gone through um, a, a very brief overview of what we found uh, in the paper and um, some some of the highlight figures are well yes 50% of the tools in our list is coming from the US uh, about 50% are, are private um, out of the 271 tools with uh, more than 400 people involved only 38 are women and nine tools are supported by consortial um, um, agreements or consortial uh, or consortia um, in, in grants, the highest volume received, at least from the information we've been able to find, is 6 million. Um, v, in VC funding is 400 million, and I'm sure you noticed it was for Qualtrics. Um, in terms of uh, the markets which are saturated, so where there are plenty of tools, are serving social media. Although, I would not be surprised if there are uh, innovations coming from um, academia and those spaces, and especially I've already seen some in the survey space and um, the area that we are exploring currently is uh, tax mining and um, it's a big uh, still a big challenge is sharing and citation and but solvable <laughs> so another pit stop right now on the future of tools and um, obviously this is something that's really really hard to do it's quite hard to um, uh, I guess it's hard to say something with certainty, but I can definitely speculate for the sake of, of the discussion. Um, and so the way I like to think about this is um, essentially considering three questions. So um, uh, first is uh, where, well, what are we going to be obsessed with? Because um, in my mind, that's what social science researchers want to study. So society and what people are doing. And second is where will this data sit? And third is, exactly where will the most promising researchers, um, the most promising social science researchers be, so the influential figures. And you can, there are, obviously there are a range of possibilities. Um, the, uh, there, I'll, I'll start, I'll start, I'll start with the scariest one, I guess. <laughs> so the scariest one would be that, um, um, all, so we will be we will be online all the time, and all our data will uh, will be collected and will sit with um, large uh, companies uh, that um, sort of use it for purposes of I don't know selling and uh, increasing their profits. And the most promising researchers will actually work for those companies, uh, which will be to some extent useful because then they have access to almost maybe almost unlimited uh, resources, unlimited computational power, uh, but um, I guess the, the drive and the reason for the type of research that they will be doing uh, are, is actually going to uh, be um, specifically around increasing profits for, for the company that they're working for. And so the, the, you know, the, the bigger questions around understanding society will, will suffer a lot. However, uh, considering that a lot of the innovation, a lot of the innovation that we've seen in the development of these tools is actually coming from academic research and that there are still governments around the world that are um, trying to put some, some breaks um, on, on the data hoarders and um, that are trying to um, to think about how personal data is being managed um, and that there are actually an increasing number of startups um, that are more conscious about how they collect and use their data and are willing and are worried and they are actually asking, some of them asking even us, how do they work with researchers uh, to make sure that the data that they're collecting is used for good. Um, so this is very hopeful. 
example. Um, and also, um, quite importantly, I think there are a number of foundations around uh, the world and um, uh, so, some, I'm, I'm not sure if you've, you've seen, but there's a, an initiative from the Chan Zuckerberg Foundation, uh, which is aiming to fund and support the researchers that have already developed uh, great tools that are used by the community. So, to, to support them so that those tools get maintained um, and become sustainable. And so hopefully we'll see that happening, not just in the biomedical type of research, but across all disciplines. So if you want to find more about, uh, about tools or if you want to be in, uh, to sort of be kept in the loop, I guess, uh, with what we're doing around tools, uh, we have the Sage Ocean uh, blogs uh, that Amy mentioned at the beginning, and we've already uh, published uh, a number of deep dives. Um, you can, you definitely should sign up for the Big Data Newsletter. If you haven't yet, we are trying to um, um, put some spotlights on emerging technologies in, in each of the newsletters. And um, the Sage Ocean Tools Directory that Amy mentioned, we do have a collection of tools in there. However, I will say that the full list that is behind this white paper is now available and we have it on a GitHub page and uh, we'll send the link after this seminar. Um, so yeah, so you can, you can use it, it's public domain, you can use it, reuse it and do whatever you prefer. But also please, please do tell us uh, if we've missed some, some of the tools. <laughs> And in terms of what we're doing next, um, we are going to run and uh, follow up webinars with deep dives into each of these area as we are um, analyzing them. The next one will be on text mining. Um, the, we are hoping that um, as we deep dive into these areas, we'll um, discover uh, more and more tools. We'll obviously have to think about ways in making that more searchable. Um, and so we are trying to work with Wikidata uh, to, uh, to do that. Uh, and if you are developing uh, tools or you just have an idea, do um, submit it to our concept grants. Deadline is in February. And if you have any ideas or other suggestions, or um, if you if you want to ask us something, or you want to, um, I don't know, <laughs> give us some advice, do get in touch. So um, for now, I'll say thank you. But I will. Um, give control back to Amy because we are quite interested in uh, finding out, so running another poll, uh, we are quite interested in finding out um, how you could use the, this information that, that I've just gone through and um, yeah. And then we'll go over to your questions. Okay, okay. Hi, everyone. hi everyone. Thanks, Thanks very, very much, much Daniela. Daniela. And, and as Daniela, Daniela said, said I'm, I'm going, going to, to mute. Mute. Yeah, mute. Sorry, we were getting an echo there. Um, I'm just going to run another poll on about how how you could use the content or information um, covered in this webinar. So the poll is live now. So if you could all, I'll give you a couple of minutes to fill it in, and then we'll go into the Q and A what people have been sending in for Twitter and through the question box. It's coming in. So at the moment, largely research. We'll give it a minute longer. Very, very close to everyone finishing. Okay. So I'm just going to share the results of that poll quickly. So you can see largely 54% of people said my research. Um, then just curious, my teaching and my career. Okay, brilliant. One second. Okay, so now we're going to go into the Q&A. So thank you everyone who sent in their questions um, through the question box and on Twitter. Um, so I'm going to start with, can you see my screen, Daniela? No. Oh, sorry, I'll share my screen first. Um, sharing. There we go. Great. So we had a question from Jeffrey Gerd, and apologies, Jeffrey, if I'm pronouncing your surname incorrectly there, about how many tools out there were multilingual, or were there many that were multilingual, Daniela? That's, that's a very good question. 
we haven't specifically looked at that, uh, but it's um, it's probably an interesting feature we should be uh, collecting. We did unfortunately uh, focus or at least um, were driven by the English speaking tools. Uh, however, we did find uh, or come across a number of tools. I mean, specifically, I am um, I speak French and, and Russian, so I've found some of the tools that are used in France and in Russia, so I can say uh, that. Uh, but I unfortunately, I can't tell you a number or a figure or percentage. Great. Then we had a question from Stella Park about what is the difference between annotating text versus qualitative analysis? Yes, that's that's a very good question um, and probably something that uh, a researcher with more experience <laughs> should answer uh, in this space. But uh, the difference, so we with the difference that we made, um, I guess in, in the way we classified or we clustered these tools um, is, so qualitative analysis would be that have more than just the annotation. Um, so let's say if um, you can do some some maybe basic, um, um, I don't know, word clouds and um, some some other type of close reading rather than uh, simply annotating the text. Um, so there are so for example, you know, if you think about it in NVivo, you can do more than just um, tagging or annotating the text. And there are tools like Anaphora where you, you can only do uh, the text annotation. I don't know if that answers the question. Thanks, Daniela. Um, we had another question here from Darko Rakvik about is SPSS, uh, is the SPSS statistical package considered the most effective in the social sciences and humanities still? <laughs> That's, that's, I love that question. Um, and I don't think I can answer it. Um, I can say what my opinion is and I can say based on the trends that we're seeing um, that uh, definitely uh, Python is uh, taking over. And if you look at, for example, digital humanities, a lot of the courses in digital humanities are teaching Python over, over R or over SPSS, um, but in terms of which one can give you the most value, I think it's up to you uh, to decide in terms of the type of thing that you're trying to achieve um, and you know the type of skills that you have. Uh, it, it may be that uh, you know you, uh, you're, you the, the research you're doing is is very specific, and you know th that that type of package is only available in I don't know. Um, are <laughs> and then and then you you know that will be the best tool for you uh, but if you if you can do things in SPSS then use it we have a question from Tonya Hall saying you sp spoke about survey monkey Qualtrics etc in your opinion what is the best free survey tool Ah, it, well, the, a lot of these tools are free to use up uh, with limitations, so up to a certain number. So um, I love using Typeform because um, a lot of people now answer surveys from their um, mobile phones and Typeform so far is the easiest to use on a mobile phone, but it has limitations. So for example, if you want to use it to send it to more than 100 people, you have to pay. But there are actually, I will answer, um, I will give one more example. Uh, so what I heard from a number of researchers and the reason they love, for, for instance, Qualtrics and they think Qualtrics is much better is because they can integrate it easily with a lot of other tools. So for example, if they, some researchers um, were developing a little game around uh, misinformation. So to check how people uh, perceive misinformation and they did some mock websites and they could integrate Qualtrics with that wireframe and so they that's why they thought well that's the better survey tool for us brilliant uh, we've got another question from Rajko Merzik did you come across a tool specifically designed for anthropological research ethnographic specifically yes <laughs> <laughs> there yes there are so um um, I, I can't tell from memory to be honest but uh, I can I can look it up there was one definitely called ethnograph um, so that was 
that sounds like one for uh, ethnography. Um, there were some tools that weren't necessarily designed for um, ethnographic research in particular, but I thought they were quite useful. So um, there was a tool I came across, and I can't remember the name now, but they were allowing uh, researchers to collect information in the field. So for example, if they go into uh, areas where there is no uh, Wi-Fi or no network, that they could still collect the data um, about, I don't know, the maybe the the societies or, or the people they were studying. Thank you. Um, another question from Stella Park on, do we have any scanning software tools or companies we recommend to scan paper based on school surveys, like to replace data um, entry of pencil and paper surveys? mean? Um, do you mean um, scanning um, assessments? So scanning assessments and extracting the, the I guess, the information or OCRing the information. Is that, is that what you mean? I believe it is, but I'll let Stella answer in the um, comment box. Um, she said yes in capitals. <laughs> I haven't come across that, but you know, there. If you actually quite interesting, if you check the uh, so the data foundry, the National Scottish Library's data foundry, um, I have a feeling that is it is possible that they have something similar because they do have large collections of uh, assessments that they've scanned, and I wouldn't be surprised if they have an OCR specifically for uh, for that type of data. Thank you. Um, we've got a really, really good question here um, from Janet Palketat. Janet, I'm very apologize, apologize if I've got your surname wrong there. Um, so could you tell us a little bit more about software developed to collect experimental behavior data, e.g. reaction time, versus, versus the survey-based self-report studies or text analysis tools? Okay, so is if do I understand the question correctly? So, do are, are you asking whether um, the experiment design or experiment uh, type platforms uh, collect data about response time? I'll let, let Janet respond. Okay, we have another response from Jenny. Yeah, we'll, we'll hold that, we'll pause that one for a minute and come back to that one. But instead, one from Joyce Thompson saying, Joyce is concerned that if we adopt one of the newer non-commercial cloud-based systems um, for a, the, the, her research project, that it will disappear or run out of funding um, or institutional support before they finish their product, their project. Is there any reliable source of info on the life cycle of these tools or of the availability of these tools? So meaning open source tools that are cloud-based and they probably just started. Mm -hmm. So the, I, I, that's a really good question. And I think a lot of researchers are concerned about this uh, specifically because it's hard to start using a new tool to then for it then to be completely um, kind of go bad and default. Certainly, because I can I can hear myself. Sorry. <laughs> um, so um, there there are some some indications and there are some ways in which you can assess that. Um, and so probably the first thing that I would look at is the number of users and the number of contributors. Obviously, if this is just starting and you know if it's like a friend of yours that's coming saying, oh, we've developed this and can you use it so we grow our community? Um, obviously, it will very much depend on, on how quickly it will grow afterwards. Um, but um, other other good indicators, I will say, are um, the way the way that tool or the way that the, the team around the tool is structured. So how are they planning? You know, talk to them, ask them how are they planning to maintain this uh, post um, 
you know, in the next two, three years, depending on, on what they're planning to do. And so that that's at the moment, that's the easiest thing to, to do. Obviously, as, as you know, whether it's commercial or non-commercial, um, the likelihood of, of tools dying is, is or startups or other stuff dying is, is quite high. So it's always it's always a risk. Even an established company, even an established company that is charging you for um, a particular um, use of of their tool um, can go away. <laughs> Okay, thank you. We've had a few questions coming about specific, um, if you found tools for specific uses. Um, so, for example, um, did you take into account or have you encountered any tool that is specifically dedicated to the analysis of historical sources? So, um, there are, uh, and I think it depends on what kind of historical sources you're trying to look at. Um, I would I would start with the dirt directory because um, that's uh, in the uh, I'd say more for historians and humanists uh, because they are looking for data that's sort of beyond current level um, and you can find loads of tools in there uh, but it depends also what kind of analysis you want to do um, so is it just collecting or finding those uh, those um, resources or is it more than that so you know if you want to do any sort of text analysis then you don't necessarily need a tool that's specific for for um, historical resources but there are also um, so also also probably look at uh, Pelagios Commons, but there are also some uh, European uh, infrastructure um, platforms that are, uh, you know, that are aggregating uh, different collections of historical resources. So that will be a good starting point. Okay, and I'm going to run through a couple more of the ones on specific tools, but then I think we should probably just call out where they can find the tool list afterwards as well. Um, so we've got, do you by any chance know of tools um, for field notes, particularly, uh, particularly for participatory observation methods? And we've got another question about tools for analysing images, especially for fine arts research. Yes. <laughs> Unfortunately, I can't remember the names off the top of my head, but the tool list will be available. As, and it is available. We'll, we'll send the, the, the GitHub link so you can have a look. Uh, and um, so for image analysis, that's very interesting. You can do image analysis in NVivo, for example, but it depends, again, it depends what kind of image analysis you do or you want to do. It depends on the, the size of your collection. Like, do you have uh, 10 images or do you have, I don't know, 100,000 images? And do you want to automatically extract? If you want to automatically extract tags, there are loads of uh, free algorithms from like Clarify and the, the Google um, uh, image um, annotation that you can use. There are also loads of image annotation uh, startups that um, have uh, increased in numbers recently and specifically driven by the driverless cars, right? So that whole industry needs uh, a lot of tools to annotate images and sort of define the, the lines of whatever object you are trying to pick from the image. Uh, and there are loads of algorithms around, for instance, if you're, uh, there's quite a cool one, actually, I remembered now, it's called open pose, for instance, if you want to analyze the human pose in different pictures. So again, it, it really it really depends what, what you're trying to, um, to do with the images. Thanks. Um, we'll ask a few more. I know we're running out of time. Um, we've got one about, have you looked at how well a tool provides you with information on how to use it or how user friendly it is? And if so, did you find the information, was it good, was it helpful, was it actually useful? We did not look into that. Um, we we know it's a big problem, and we know it's um, it would be useful if there were sort of like more standardized ways of finding tools or discovering tools and figuring out um, how easy it is to to use them. Uh, but we we haven't had time. So all, all we we do so for our for example for our tools directory, which is a, a very small subset of the list of four hundred. Um, um, plus, um, we we did try to find um, like videos uh, that show you how to use um, those tools, so that makes it a little bit easier to um, to start 
up. But other than that, it would be really cool. Yeah. M maybe maybe a, a next project. We've got another question here about at, at sort of undergrad and postgrad level, do we know how much these tools are being used at these levels already? No, short answer is no, we don't know. It was, so even, even how much they're being used um, by academics in general, we were finding it really, really hard to figure out. Um, so we could find, for instance, in, in many tools, especially that are coming from um, from uh, teams of academics, they will have websites where they also um, suggest a paper to cite. And so if they suggest a paper to cite, then it's relatively easy to see, well, who cited the paper, then those people have used the tool. Uh, but because citation is not um, there are principles, but is not yet um, standardized. Um, this, well, at least the same as, as papers. Um, you can't really find easily um, the tools that have been used because um, uh, people cite them um, in uh, footnotes, in endnotes, in sometimes as a reference. Sometimes they just mention it um, somewhere in the paper, and so you, it, it's quite hard to it's it's quite hard to make a good comparison at least in terms of aggregate usage of the tools and then uh, try to filter. So try to filter uh, by, let's say, discipline. Uh, so for example, we know that uh, red, uh, red cap is used a lot, right? Um, and um, most of it, most of its usage is coming from uh, biomedical research and clinical research. There is some social science research, but for example, I can't tell you the numbers. I could find a few papers, but I can't tell you with, with absolute certainty this is the number of times that this tool has been used in the social sciences and so given that that is hard it's quite hard to say uh, what um, what type of tools uh, uh, undergraduate and postgraduate uh, students are using um, although it will be interesting to know and maybe it quite depends on what they're exposed to maybe what they're being taught in in uh, class and so on We've got a really great question from Joyce Thompson. It's a little bit on the other side of this, saying, have we encountered much activity in terms of librarians and libraries supporting academics with this exploding field of tools? So have you encountered much activity in terms of librarians or libraries supporting academics with this exploding field of tools? So, um... We so so obviously you you probably might have heard of let's say the software carpentry and the data carpentry and so there are some organizations that are uh, trying to set up training and then a number of librarians that we've uh, talked with they are trying to follow a similar model and support with. Uh, some training or introductory training in the use of different tools. And we found that specifically around, and just because we're exploring it now, we found that specifically around text mining because um, in many cases, the librarians are the first people that researchers go to when they need, um, well, obviously access to, to, to uh, corpora for text mining. And then they also need to know, want to know, well, how then do I do this? Like what? What sort of tools are there? How can you tell me more? Um, and so, some um, so, yes, some librarians do organize um, introductory type of training. Maybe they are uh, every now and again. There is an increasing number uh, of research technologists. So whether that's a librarian or someone from the research support um, teams that actually tries to specialize in a variety of tools and know what to um, recommend when researchers are uh, asking. Um, so I think that's that's a really good trend. And um, the other thing that I have noticed is uh, working groups. So especially within um, social sciences, um, 
type departments, so or at least where um, quantitative methods are taught uh, quite extensively at the undergraduate level. They set up so students together with professors and together with um, um, early career and, uh, and um, uh, researchers like postgraduate and just graduated, just did their vivas and so on. They set some working groups where they meet maybe every now and again, um, once a month or one like every uh, first Friday of every month where they meet and they discuss uh, different methods and different tools that they use and share that information and help each other out. Okay, so we've got sort of one minute left, so I'm going to ask the final question. Um, we've had tons and tons of questions come in, so if your question hasn't been answered, don't worry, we've kept track of them. And what we'll do is we'll do a follow-up blog where Daniel has answered these questions in writing. Um, and that will go on the Sage Ocean blog. And we've also had a lot of other questions come in about some of the resources we spoke about, Sage Campus, etc. You will all get an email tomorrow with links to the white page where you can download this, link to the GitHub that uh, Daniela mentioned where you can see the list of tools, um, your discount code for the Sage Campus courses, etc. So that will be coming to you tomorrow. But then in the meantime, for the last question, it was saying, <laughs> Does tool development seem to be happening in particular disciplines over others? And this is from Douglas. Is there a discipline that's leading the way or is use across disciplines and development? So in terms of whether, whether um, more tools are, are being developed in other disciplines or is that right? Yeah. So I think I only have a sort of like a, a finger in the air type answer for this because um, I actually didn't spend probably enough time looking at what type of tools other disciplines are, are developing. But I would say that um, there is a, there are a lot of tools being developed in other disciplines. Um, and there are also a lot of tools being developed in the social sciences. Uh, and especially, especially now as, as more researchers are trying to work with social media data, with image data, with other type of data that, uh, that comes in larger scale than, than previously. So lo there are, there are tools that, there, that are being developed across all disciplines. Um, and um, there, there definitely are crossovers. Um, so there are tools that are being developed uh, in clinical uh, science and in, in, in clinical medicine and biomedicine, biomedical research that are uh, crossing over to social sciences. There are, mm, mm, I'm gonna think, is there a tool that has been developed in the social sciences that, have cro that has crossed over to other disciplines? I don't know, but I will look into this. Um, and there, but there are definitely tools coming from other areas and there are definitely tools that have been developed um, in, in, in digital humanities and in computational humanities and in computational linguistics that are being uh, prolifically used in the social sciences. So that was one part of the question. What was the second part of the question? It was around if the usage is in, within one discipline. So if, if poli-sci creates a tool for poli-sci, is it being used outside of as well? So, um, yeah, so that, that was, okay, so um, definitely from other disciplines, but from the social sciences or, or across the different social sciences, like disciplines, um, there, is, there is definitely crossover. So there's definitely tools that have been maybe developed in, uh, in political science that are used by, uh, by sociologists and so forth. So yes, that, that happens, uh, even though less so for the methods, but definitely uh, a lot for the tools because they, yeah, um, yes. Okay, I know we're over time. And so thank you everyone very much for joining. Thank you. There have been so many questions coming in and they've been really great. So we will get to them. Sorry that they weren't answered today. Um, and as I said, all the resources will be emailed to you tomorrow. Do let us know how, what you thought of the webinar. And thank you very much, Daniela. That was really great. Nice. Um, so thanks everyone. And don't forget to subscribe to the Big Data Newsletter at ocean.stagepub.com.